Hey folks, thanks for tuning in today. I came across a story about a workshop that was held uh, years ago at a Christian college. The title of the workshop was Dealing with the Gray Areas of Life. And the, the classroom was jam-packed that day. This was kind of a felt need for those Christian college kids. And the professor made three lists with those students that day. And to start us off today, we're gonna pretend to be in that classroom. For just a few minutes, I get to be Dr. Robinson. And we're gonna think about three lists together too. Now, the first one is a list of things that are always wrong for every Christian. I mean, like really clear things from the Bible that everyone pretty much knows are always wrong. Like murder, that's a big one. Absolutely wrong for every single one of us. Or stealing, or lying, or cheating, or malice, or gossip. Always wrong for every single Christian. We can read our Bibles and find these without a doubt. Now, another list that they made and we're making here, list number two, and this is what the professor did that day. He, he said, there's another group of things that are always right for every Christian. Like a few of those might be honesty, love, prayer, servanthood, kindness, you know, those kinds of things. And those are clear as well, crystal clear. We, we could list out maybe the fruit of the Spirit from the Bible in Galatians 5, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are always good. Lots of teaching in the Bible about those. But then list number three, and this one's not as easy, it's a list of the gray areas for things that seem wrong to some Christians and maybe not wrong to others. Now, there are lots of things that have been on this list down through the years. Like we can include things like drinking or dancing or certain kinds of music or playing cards maybe or the lottery or R-rated movies or tattoos. You know, believe it or not, Harry Potter at one point would have been on this list. You know, Early on, a lot of folks thought Harry Potter kind of promoted some things that weren't so great until the end. And then everybody said, it's a Christian story. You know, three cheers for Harry Potter. But there are lots of areas in which Christians kind of disagree about this. We, we could go on and on with this kind of list. And the really interesting thing is that over the years and in various cultures and various parts of the world, this list especially has morphed and changed quite a bit. For example, did you know that in the Middle Ages, it was considered immoral to charge interest on a loan? But that's not how it is today, is it? I mean, Christians use credit cards and take out mortgages without any guilt, or at least very little. In the early years of our country, there were certain groups like the Shakers, for example, and they forbid marriage and sex, which is probably why there aren't any of them around anymore. You know, there was the founder of Oberlin College, a revivalist, some of you may have heard of before. His name was Charles Finney. And when he started that school, he insisted that the school ban coffee and tea and some other stimulants, along with things like pepper, mustard, oil and vinegar. Oil and vinegar. Like imagine what do you think of Mountain Dew and Red Bull if you were still around. You know, throughout the decades, Christians have often disagreed about what's appropriate behavior on the Sabbath or on a Sunday. Some of you might remember that terrific movie from back in 1981, Chariots of Fire, had the memorable synthesizer theme song, you know. It's a story about how the main character, Eric Little, refused to run a heat in his major Olympic event because it was held on a Sunday. He was willing to give up a medal to hold to his belief that it'd be a sin to race on a Sunday. So what do we do about all these behaviors and practices that some would consider to be sinful and wrong to do while others see the very same activity and are perfectly okay with it? It's a gray area. Well, dealing with the gray areas it's the focus of the chapters in Paul's letter to the Corinthians that we're going to look at today. We've been in this series called Same Difference, and we've been looking at the book from the Bible written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. And Paul spends several chapters, chapters 8, 9, and 10, a rather lengthy discussion for Paul to deal with this very thing. We'll mainly focus on chapter 8. Let's check it out, starting with verse 1 of chapter 8. Now, about food sacrificed to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God 
is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Now, at first glance, you may be thinking, Dave, last week you talked about sex. And I was with you then. Like, you could hear a pin drop. I guess you could hear a pin drop every week in here, right? <laughs> anyway, what in the world does eating meat sacrifice to idols have to do with anything in our world today? And I doubt seriously you were saying to your family, I sure do hope Dave talks about meat sacrifice to idols at CCC this weekend. We were just talking about that at breakfast. Well, this particular issue Paul's addressing really has no meaning for us, none. But the principles behind it do. And in order to learn the principles behind what Paul's talking about here, principles that most definitely apply to us, we need to understand as fully as possible the issue the Corinthian Christians faced. A big question for them was whether or not to eat meat that had been sacrificed first to idols. Now, again, on the surface, we might see the complexity of the issue and we may try to give an easy answer, but we got to understand how thoroughly idolatry and pagan practices and sacrifices just permeated all levels of Greek and Roman society. It would be almost impossible for any Christian to escape contact with idol worship and their influence. There were two sources of meat in the ancient world. One was the regular market where, by the way, prices were always higher. And the other was in the local temples. It was a highly accepted social practice to have meals in a temple, places often associated with an idol. We could think of them today almost like restaurants. This is where many public and private occasions were held, including meetings, weddings, things like that. And to have nothing to do with those gatherings would require just kind of cutting yourself off from almost all social interaction with your community. You would essentially have to withdraw from community life. And it gets even more complicated when an idol worshiper offered an animal sacrifice to their God. What, whatever was left over from that sacrifice, it was used in different ways. For instance, the priests would use some of it for their own personal needs and for their own personal dinners. And then much of the meat left over would later be sold in the market. And it'd be very difficult for any customer shopping in the market to know for sure whether the meat sold in a given shop had been part of a sacrifice or not. It's not like it was clearly labeled like, you know, idol meat or anything like that. Here's the hormone free meat and over here is the sacrifice to idol meat. You know, you had no idea. Now, the Corinthian Christians did agree on one thing. All right. That it was a sin to worship idols. They all agreed on that. That was very, very clear. Paul actually reiterates that here in these chapters. But they argued among themselves whether it was okay to meet, eat, eat meat in the temples as part of a feast or, or in a private home or even to buy meat in the market if they were uncertain where it came from. So they write a letter to Paul looking to him for some guidance on how to live as a Christian in a very complex culture. And they asked him about this particular issue. And they wanted a really, really clear answer which is why Paul begins this section by saying, now about food sacrifice to idols. And there were diff definitely two different camps among the Corinthians with uh, opposing views. And this was causing a serious division in the church. There was what we might call the freedom camp. And those were what Paul calls the stronger Christians. Paul refers to them that way. Those who had maybe been embracing the faith for a longer time. They believed that they were free to eat this meat because idols weren't really God's and so none of the practices involved in these sacrifices really meant anything. And they also wanted to continue socializing with others rather than isolating themselves from various feasts and neighborhood gatherings and things like that. So that was their point of view, the freedom group. But then the other camp was made up of folks who might have been newer to the faith. They were just starting out on the journey. They felt guilty eating the meat, especially if they knew it had been sacrificed. They were kind of looking for a rigid list of do's and don'ts for any and every situation. And we, we might call them the legalism group. And they were certainly looking for Paul to strictly prohibit the practice of eating meat sacrificed to idols. 
All right, so both sides were hoping for a yes or a no answer from Paul, but that's not what they got from him. Instead, Paul lays down some principles for how to function as a Christian in a non-Christian secular society, which touches you and me here in 2021. How do you function as a Christian in a largely non-Christian secular society? Well, what we discover in these chapters is that Paul has a greater concern than just this specific situation. And this is what we need to pick up on. Paul's greater concern is how we make love our highest aim as we relate to and engage with those around us, both inside and outside the church. So Paul begins the whole thing with the obligation of Christian love. Look, look again at verse one. He's quoting someone there when he says, we all possess knowledge. And this is probably what the stronger Christians were saying, you know, the freedom group. We possess knowledge. We know that this food sacrificed to idols doesn't mean anything. So Paul goes on to contrast knowledge with love. He's not against knowledge, but he's aware that knowledge alone can be wielded as a weapon. I mean, several times in the whole letter to the Corinthians, Paul uses the term puffed up to describe them. He was clearly concerned about their tendency to be prideful. And these Corinthians, who he, again, he calls the strong Christians, they sometimes acted in a condescending manner toward those who didn't share their level of knowledge. And Paul says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. He's cautioning all of us to be very, very humble as we acquire whatever knowledge and realize that any knowledge we do have is still pretty incomplete. I mean, we swim in deep waters, gang. You ever been guilty of allowing knowledge to puff you up? It's quite possible for a person to be incredibly smart about the Bible and about doctrine and yet just be lacking in the fruits of the Spirit, you know, like love and joy and humility and self-control and gentleness. Some Christians have a far bigger head than heart. And Paul's not putting down knowledge. I mean, this is really important. He's not knocking on knowledge, but he is warning us of the danger that we can become conceited as we acquire more and more knowledge and understanding. One commentator says, knowledge is power and it must be used in love, but love must always be controlled by knowledge. So, both are needed in every single one of us. I know many students are getting ready to head off to college if they haven't already gone. And what you'll encounter at many schools, you know, there are some professors, brilliant, accomplished, knowledgeable professors who are just scary smart. And, and some professors you'll have are pretty full of themselves too. I mean, the prestige just kind of got on their heads. They're pretty puffed up. I can remember a professor I had back in college, had several classes under him. And you knew like, hey, don't cross him. Don't, don't challenge him because he'll just kind of cut you up in a thousand pieces. And he did sometimes. I watched as he carved up a whole bunch of folks. But I also remember another professor, uh, Dr. Brad Blue was his name, and he was brilliant, but he was incredibly gracious and kind. He actually looked like Eric Clapton a little. I always wondered if he shot the sheriff or knew what happened after midnight, that kind of thing. Anyway, he also didn't have a pointer finger either. Uh, it got chopped off, I think, in a hockey accident, if I remember. He always dreamed about being a hockey coach and a Hebrew professor somewhere. But anyway, he'd point to the, to the board with his middle finger there, and you'd be like, Dr. Blue just flipped me off, you know? Anyway, he was a brilliant scholar who could cut you up in an intellectual discussion. But he walked and taught and related to us with such humility and grace and gentleness. And Paul warns us about getting all puffed up with knowledge and it resulting in just draining the love and concern from your life. Then in verses four through six, Paul essentially gives an answer about the whole meat and idol situation. He, uh, he really says it's an amoral issue. Eating the meat that had been sacrificed to idols wasn't a sin in God's eyes. And he says, they're absolutely free to do so. He says, an idol, after all, is nothing in this world. In other words, Words they, they don't really exist. There's nothing to them because there's only one true God, he says. Idols are imaginary and they have no power to pollute a Christian. Now imagine the Corinthian Christians. They've been waiting for this letter to arrive from Paul. And it's not like they all got a copy of it. They read it together. So someone must have been in the front of the room, whatever room they were gathering in. And, and they're reading this for everybody. And they're all on the edge of their seats because half of them think one thing and half of them think the other. And they get to this point in the letter. 
And I can imagine the people in the freedom group who were on the side of eating meat sacrificed to idols. They held up Paul's letter and declared with great excitement and pride, see, we were right, ended the debate. And then someone from the other group, you know, the legalism group, quietly says, you know, well, is that the end of the letter? Is, is there anything else? Is there any more? And somebody took that letter, that manuscript, and said, well, actually, there is a little more. And they kept reading what we call verse 7. And verse 7 begins with a very small but hugely powerful word, the word but. He writes this, but not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, he writes, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't they be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat, Paul writes, causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. See, Paul says that while we're free to do certain things, another question has got to be asked first. And it's a question that we don't like to ask. Is there any reason to limit my freedom? Is there any reason to limit my individual freedom out of concern for somebody else in the church? And then in chapter 9, he talks about outside the church too. Is this a situation where I choose to lay aside my rights, lay aside my pride, lay aside even my pleasure in order that someone else can be built up and not destroyed, not tripped up? I mean, in my heart, I may know that something's not harmful for me and my conscience may be completely clear. And yet I make a very mature and loving choice to refrain and abstain from something out of care for somebody else. A person, Paul writes, for whom Christ died. See, we're cautioned here not to create a stumbling block that will trip somebody else up and make their maturing process more difficult. And the words Paul chooses are quite strong. He says we can potentially bring spiritual disaster to somebody else. Paul makes it crystal clear that tripping up another Christian, it's a serious sin. It is a big, big deal. See, we live in an era, you and I, where more than ever we are taught to demand our freedom. We are urged to demand our right and boldly express our freedom which can sometimes make it difficult to follow Jesus because there are times that he limits our freedom. And this is one of them. To have the wisdom to discern what to do and what not to do is a mature, mature thing. And listen, Paul, if, if you look at all his letters, he wrote about 13 letters in the Bible. Paul is a huge advocate for freedom. But he says that our freedom must be checked by our love. In chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, Paul continues the same thing. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. I mean, just because we have the right doesn't mean we should flaunt it or indiscriminately engage in any activities that could trip somebody else up. And this is a rub for us. See, we're steeped in a culture that says, you're free, and if somebody else has a problem with it, well, that's on them. I mean, think about social media. Our context operates by saying, you ought to be free to post anything you want, and if somebody gets offended or hurt or has a problem with it, well, so what? Post what you want to post. And Paul confronts that kind of thinking. He actually summarizes this whole chapter by making an example of himself. He does that so well and so often. He writes that if what he ate would cause another person to fall, then he's willing to never eat meat again. Paul's very dramatic here because the stakes are high. I mean, liberty and freedom are valuable, but sometimes we gotta choose to waive our freedom for the sake of someone else. See, the point isn't freedom 
And the point isn't a yes or no to any and every situation. The point Paul is driving home is to be so marked by love and concern for those around us that we're way less concerned about our freedom or a rigid list of do's and don'ts. You know, some of you might remember, and you might have been at CCC on the Sunday following when the governor of our state, Governor Hogan, came out on a Friday. This was back in June, I think, early June. And it was later in the day on Friday, and he makes an announcement about masks. He essentially said, if you've been fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask inside any longer. And again, this was late in the day on a Friday, and we've paid pretty close attention this past year to what the governor says at his press conferences. Uh, a lot of times it would directly impact us here at CCC and our services. And so right after that, right after he made that announcement, we kind of got on the horn, circled in our leadership team, eventually circled in the elders of CCC, and we kicked around, does this have any impact on us going into this weekend specifically? Do we need to say anything right now, announce anything, that kind of deal? And we decided that we wouldn't say anything this late in the game. Instead, we'd pay close attention to how folks responded in our church. And I got to tell you, I was so proud of our church. Our staff team and, and several who volunteer on teams, they noticed that as people came through the doors that particular Sunday after Governor Hogan's announcement, there were a myriad of folks who came in carrying a mask. And they'd kind of walk through the doors and then they would look around and they would see, they would assess, should I wear a mask? Should I put the mask on? Lots and lots of people, they were fully vaccinated. They had the freedom to not wear the mask but they had concern for others and they were assessing whether they should still choose to wear one. And listen, this isn't about wearing a mask, not wearing a mask. It was the posture so many in our church had. Love, concern, not freedom was the aim in that short, simple moment. I was very proud of the posture of CCC that day. Following Jesus can be really complex. And you can tell if someone is taking the journey toward God and are maturing in their faith and their relationship with Him when they're limiting their freedom out of love and concern for those inside the church and those outside the family of faith. So maybe a good thing to do is ask yourself, which group would I honestly find myself in right now? The freedom group? The legalism group? Think about which of these camps you tend to drift toward. Are you being swept away in the name of your individual freedoms, regardless of the damage you might be doing to those around you in our church or in your greater circle of influence? Or are you caught up in any form of legalism, kind of too concerned with the externals and maybe isolating yourself because of your long lists of do's and don'ts? You're just withdrawing from the culture, not standing firm, you know, not being in the world, but not of the world. Or, you know, there's a whole another group Maybe you'd admit to becoming too permissive with your behavior to the point that you just blended right in with the culture. There's nothing distinct about you at all. And you're not pursuing holiness and Christian behaviors that would reveal to others that you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ. Your life essentially declares there are no gray areas. Almost anything goes. So you've just become an underground Christian, blending right in, Christian in name only. My challenge is for all of us to keep moving in the direction of mature love and concern for those around us, both inside and outside the church. And we'd have such a strong desire to see those, you know, just everyone come to know the freedom and life and grace and truth that's found through Jesus Christ. That's where Paul lands in these chapters, you know, nine and 10. He go goes on one of the great riffs in the Bible. And I thought we'd just end with it today and listen to it and let it soak in. Check it out. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law became like one not having the law. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel 
that I may share in its blessing. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the richness of your word. Sometimes we can read it and at first glance, it doesn't look like it has much to say to us. And then as we dig in and we just see your incredible wisdom, you know, down through the centuries, principles that we can hang on to. And these chapters are no exception. Please forgive us for the times when we kind of take the easy route, when we do make lists of do's and don'ts and get all called up in legalism and separate ourselves from a community around us that you've actually called us to reach. But also forgive us, Father, when we become so permissive that there's just nothing distinct about us. As we go, wherever we go, as we head to work, as we go to school, as we relate to those on our teams and in our neighborhoods, Father, may we be known as people who just reflect the best in you. They're loving and kind and gracious and generous and just. I pray you'd help us increasingly allow our lives to just shine brightly so that so many will be drawn to you. It's in the name of our Savior who got all this so right that we pray. Amen.